I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Sasa von Meyer from Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at UC Berkeley, a prominent me member from the California Institute for Energy and Environment and Environment and Citrus. She's going to tell us about uh, <clears throat> about resilience at scale and about the EcoBlock program. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm going to go quiet and I'm going to turn it over to Sasa. Thank you so much, Costas. And uh, let me take a moment here to um, go into full screen mode. It's my pleasure um, to, uh, to present here and tell you about the Oakland EcoBlock project. I'm assuming audio and video is all good. Um, my talk really focuses on the issue of scale and uh, both the challenge of reaching down deep enough into the electric infrastructure to make fine adjustments, but also the challenge of aggregating so that we can change the grid and decarbonize more quickly. So uh, in the big picture, why are we here? We are having to, uh, in the words of John Holdren, President Obama's uh, science advisor, uh, we're having to uh, avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable when it comes to climate change. So uh, this is really about uh, protecting climate, but also addressing resilience, uh, addressing the adaptation that will be necessary, but doing so in an equitable manner to make sure that the most vulnerable members of society, uh, in fact, of our global society, don't get uh, left behind and suffer the worst uh, of the harm. So uh, in terms of decarbonizing the energy sector, that uh, really has three pillars in itself. It starts with energy efficiency, uh, solar and other carbon neutral energy resources clearly are uh, a key uh, policy push uh, right now, but also electrification of uh, end uses that use fuels such as natural gas in the home or gasoline and diesel in transportation because electricity is easier to decarbonize than fuels. In parallel with that, for the resilience aspect, we have to look at the survivability um, of extreme events. Uh, extreme weather of all sorts, and then uh, keeping in mind the environmental justice dimension, both protecting people from harm, but also allowing people uh, of, of all income levels really to enjoy the technology that many people now are enjoying in terms of having clean solar on their homes, uh, having uninterrupted power uh, during outages. Uh, let me say just a word about uh, the graphic that I'm using here with the, uh, the blocks. Um, this is really to illustrate uh, the replicability of a model that um, I'll be telling you about the Oakland EcoBlock model for scaling up quickly because there are blocks everywhere. Um, everywhere you look, uh, urban, suburban, even in rural areas, it's a unit of transformation. Um, let me speak briefly to uh, lessons learned last year, this year uh, from power outages. Uh, for example, in California and Texas due to extreme hot wildfires and extreme cold. Uh, it is now undeniably a reality that extreme weather is here. We also learned that infrastructures are interdependent. So for example, uh, in Texas, when the electricity went out, uh, that was partly related to natural gas uh, production being stopped down um, from uh, the extreme cold. But then the other consequence was water infrastructure was disrupted. So we have to keep in mind that different infrastructures are interdependent and that can compound the impact of extreme events. What I thought personally was the real tragedy uh, when millions of people were out of power for hours or days in extreme cold was not the fact that the 
grid failed. It was the fact that it actually cost lives. The electric grid failing should not cost lives. Uh, it should be possible to be prepared. Uh, you know, people were uh, dying from carbon monoxide exposure. They were dying from hypothermia. That's preventable. And so this really motivates the question, how can we uh, prepare and adapt uh, intelligently? Much has been discussed about the role of electricity markets uh, in the context of Texas, as well as California, where we've had uh, occasional power shortages or uh, alerts during heat waves here. Um, I don't want to get into the electricity market issue, but to speak to uh, the things that really could have prevented the pain and suffering that ensued. Um, first of all, again, energy efficiency with buildings better insulated, uh, people would not have come to harm uh, when the electricity was out. And that holds for air conditioning or heating, right? Uh, but the other key lesson learned in Texas was that the grid operators did not have the tools at their disposal to manage the electric demand and reduce the load when they needed to in the emergency. So it was the ability to shed load gracefully that was lacking. And let's visualize that just uh, from our neighborhood here, uh, looking at the grid infrastructure, the pink lines you're seeing uh, on this map from PG&E are transmission lines. The, uh, the red triangles are substations where uh, the distribution circuits start. And if we zoom in a little bit, this is an example here, we're in North Oakland um, and the sort of blue and gold and purple lines that you see, those are the distribution circuits that uh, supply electricity to a neighborhood that uh, in the case of the Texas power outages, the only place that uh, power uh, system operators could interrupt power or reduce load was at the location of these substations. So at you know, the, the red triangle, you can just kill the power to the whole circuit. That's not very much uh, refined control, right? So when uh, customers were on the same circuit with uh, some critical load, like a hospital, a fire station, and so forth, then they're exempt from having rotating outages, while everybody on the other circuits then has to carry a greater share of the, of the outage time. So what's really uh, important in terms of advancing a smart grid with more refined control is to be able to, uh, to control power and shed unnecessary or non-critical loads at a much smaller scale. So that has several steps. First of all, we want to be able to sectionalize distribution circuits, and that just means more switch gear. Uh, in fact, smarter switch gear that's rapidly uh, controllable uh, for smaller pieces of, of circuit, uh, smaller numbers of, of customers, but then Going down even further, it means the ability to turn off power at the individual customer meter. Uh, that is not particularly advanced technology. Utilities can do that now. They're loath to do it um, because obviously a lot of regulations uh, come into play about when that's fair game and when it isn't. In an emergency, clearly we have to have the ability to turn off what's unnecessary so that people whose lives depend on having electricity uh, can survive. Even within the home, we can drill down further. So we can uh, turn off individual circuits within the home uh, with smart service panels, for example. And then within the home energy management system, we uh, can control individual appliances so that the, the user themselves can decide at a given time what should be prioritized. And then, of course, at the same time as providing as a safety net for emergencies means a huge opportunity for shaping the load and actually supporting the grid during blue sky operations and uh, making money uh, doing that. 
So uh, this is just a table kind of summarizing the different um, scales and where I think uh, some of the most important areas are for innovation. I mean, innovation is, uh, is possible. There are opportunities at each scale. But, you know, historically, the view of operating electric grids was that the generation just chases the demand. The demand is whatever it is. People can use a kilowatt hour whenever, wherever they want to. And uh, we adjust the output from large scale power plants um, to, to uh, meet that need, whatever it is. And that's great when there are plenty of resources uh, but now with particularly with uh, distributed energy, uh, with power electronic technology that allows us to control so much, we want to be controlling from the grid edge, right? And that also uh, coordinates with controlling the generation, managing uh, the solar production and managing a fleet of battery uh, or other storage resources that may be smaller scale and distributed across the grid. So uh, one direction in which smart grids are going or is looking at uh, more control at the distribution level, more refined control. The next uh, direction is microgrids. It is by now almost, I want to say, common uh, for, uh, let's say, a corporate uh, or even university campus to have uh, a microgrid that can operate as a power island uh, with a microgrid controller across multiple buildings, balancing demand and supply. A real innovation is to aggregate multiple residential buildings, uh, different utility customers into an ad hoc microgrid. Um, and on the smaller scale, again, uh, multiple residential units, uh, units within an apartment building can be coordinated uh, within the home. Again, we can go all the way down to the device level. And I think some of the interesting uh, research that's happening and where information technology really plays a role is in navigating these different scales and coordinating them with each other so that we can optimize in a given situation uh, in the way that is most flexible and most suited uh, to the situation. Um, really, there is no reason with that with distributed generation storage and load control, we cannot uh, occasionally operate sections of the electric grid as an island, um, operate independently. So for example, when we have wildfire related outages uh, where a transmission line, for example, has to de be de-energized, uh, there is no reason we can't operate that local area independently with enough control and information technology. Now, when we have a balanced cluster of generation uh, and load, really, if we're designing that local cluster to operate in a balanced manner, why not look at the bigger picture? Look at what we can improve with energy efficiency, electrification, how to make this uh, really a positive experience in terms of the quality of services of thermal comfort that we experience uh, in the building. So it's also an opportunity to look at what might be owned communally in, in terms of uh, energy assets versus what makes sense for an individual a homeowner or utility customer to own and control. Um, the approach here that we're taking with the EcoBlock is um, that families who wouldn't necessarily have the money, the initiative, um, really the time and effort to put into um, sort of creating their own microgrid for their house can join a community and a community may be able to do this less expensively uh, by forming a, an islandable microgrid using the utility infrastructure in our case um, and co-owning shared assets. 
The key word in this slide really is retrofits because there are communities that are, uh, you know, building from greenfield, uh, clean, energy efficient, solar powered housing, for example, with microgrid uh, capabilities. It's a little easier when you're starting from scratch. It's harder when you're dealing with existing homes that are older or from different generations, and you're working with different families who live on a city block and getting them together in a collaborative, cooperative uh, way. So that means challenges are not just technical, but legal and financial structures um, have to be developed for community ownership and governance, deciding how to run things. Um, how much does each uh, participant contribute, for example? Um, so the EcoBlock project funded by the California Energy Commission um, is looking into models that uh, we hope are replicable and scalable very quickly to do retrofits in urban and suburban environments to essentially transform one block at a time our residential communities and make them carbon neutral and resilient. I want to call out key players, uh, key partners uh, in this ambitious project. The city of Oakland uh, has been working with us. There are clearly legal permitting issues uh, and PG&E has been working closely with us in the design of an islandable microgrid that uses their existing infrastructure as much as possible. Because clearly PG&E has an interest in providing reliable service to their customers and realizing that sometimes their hands are tied during fire season, they have to de-energize certain equipment. Um, and so we're thinking creatively about how uh, as many critical loads as possible can be uh, kept on. So here's a picture um, of uh, you know, the neighborhood. What we look to combine uh, in the EcoBlock is community-owned rooftop solar, essentially putting as many kilowatts on each roof as will comfortably fit with some cookie cutter standardization because that's how you save on the cost. Right. You have one contractor going through and doing several dozen homes at the same time. Um, a community energy storage system. Uh, we're interested in flywheels for that uh, application as an emergent technology. Right now, we're looking at batteries. Um, so the key innovation here is for those assets to be communally owned and shared. We have started, as I mentioned, with deep energy efficiency retrofits because it's cleaner and less expensive to uh, begin with cutting the waste. Uh, also shared EVs, that's where certainly in California, we're uh, bracing ourselves for a lot of growth uh, with EV adoption. We have mandates for that and that will require some um, some upgrades of the distribution infrastructure, just as much as uh, it's, it's necessary for the infrastructure to uh, accommodate uh, the solar PV generation. Each EV adds about, again, as much electric demand as is in the house, right? So uh, really the strategic question is, we understand that there have to be upgrades made to the distribution system. How can we make those in the most uh, intelligent and strategic way? And then of course, uh, controlling loads at the most granular level with the most uh, sort of real time uh, interaction that the, the customers themselves, the users want to have uh, not forcing them to constantly uh, interact with it, but giving them the option to prioritize uh, perhaps a different appliance or a different circuit um, on a given day. So here's just a schematic uh, of the block. We're looking at uh, 33 uh, participants, uh, 32 residential, one small commercial on this block. Um, there is a, an alternate universe in which we would have a separate 
DC coupled uh, infrastructure, DC wiring behind all the meters connecting the solar uh, and the battery storage. Um, the legal and regulatory environment is still evolving. Uh, we believe that should be permissible in California under the own use uh, clause in the California Public Utilities Code, Section 218. Uh, but the interpretations are, involving, are evolving. Meanwhile, um, it really, there's much to be said for making as much use of the existing infrastructure as we can. And so even though this is an older four kilovolt um, distribution system, PG&E is working with us to look at making uh, the improvements in terms of an, um, an isolation switch, uh, some transformer upgrades, and a three-phase upgrade for a single-phase lateral uh, to allow this islandable microgrid to happen uh, on this block. So uh, the model here is that the utility retains ownership of the infrastructure, and with that, they get to insure it, and their crew gets to come and deal with it when something breaks. Um, that's a big advantage for the community uh, to not have to carry liability insurance for that infrastructure. Um, the, argue, the key strategic argument here is that uh, we're looking for the right scale um, to design sustainable communities, uh, to design smart elements of the electric grid. And in terms of the aggregation to create a power island, that has some flexibility uh, to serve the essential loads um, where the battery may be sized to make it through, um, you know, winter days for most, but not all of the loads. We believe that there's an economy of scale with aggregating somewhere on the order of tens of residences. Um, we think that if you go beyond the neighborhood scale, then things get complicated and there can be diseconomies of scale where people don't know each other. Uh, the hypothesis here, which we're testing, is that at the block scale is a sweet spot for addressing uh, water efficiency, energy efficiency, um, and uh, really healthy living in the neighborhood uh, in an effective way. Um, it is, again, really important to point out that we're looking at retrofits here. If you're building from scratch, it's a different problem. Clearly, we cannot meet our carbon goals by just raising entire neighborhoods and rebuilding them, right? Or we can't wait for housing stock or for building stock to turn over. So retrofitting is a key element here uh, in our in our strategy, we also expect that there will be, uh, fingers crossed, federal investment. There has to be some public investment in this. We can't afford not to spend money. Uh, so there has to be investment in power infrastructure, in decarbonization. And the real question here is how do we spend that money most effectively? How do we get the most bang for the buck? We understand that we will have to uh, improve grid hosting capacity for electric vehicles, for solar. How do we do that best while also gaining the benefits of resilience? In the process, we will have to retire at some point uh, natural gas because there is no way that natural gas burning in the house will be carbon neutral. It's very difficult to do carbon capture, even in an industrial setting, we're not going to do it in the homes. And so that infrastructure will have to be retired and all those end uses, the cooking, the heating uh, will have to become electric. So again, it, it's a given that that will cost some money. How do we do that most effectively and engage the communities in uh, really you know, being proactive and also uh, having the experience that this is a positive change for them rather than uh, something being taken away. So we are presently uh, in phase two of this project. Uh, phase one was a 
really theoretical and feasibility study of could you retrofit uh, a block at a time? What would this look like? Um, phase two, we're actually building it and uh, we're making the design specific to the site and dealing with all kinds of questions like, well, where does the battery actually fit given um, you know, the lots and the sidewalk and the street? Where does a new transformer go? Um, how do we deal with all the permitting? It turns out the real currency on the block, parking spaces. So when we're talking about a shared uh, fleet of electric vehicles that will be available during a crisis, during a power outage, even if the local gas station can't pump gasoline, your EV will be solar charged. Those community EVs are going to be a great asset. Uh, meanwhile, a, an immediate concern might be, well, if there's a dedicated parking space, um, do we like that? So many kind of very local, hyper-local issues that you deal with in trying to design a project like this. Uh, the scale up that we hope to uh, really spark here is a replication where we will have an EcoBlock handbook that will describe the design choices that were made for this particular block, why they were made, what one might do differently in a different situation, so that future blocks can look at what to do the same way, cookie cutter style, to cut costs and what would be uh, a more unique variant. For example, if you're in a different climate zone or if you're within a different local jurisdiction that has different rules. Uh, as much as possible, the aim here is to standardize and to turn this into a business model that can be taken by third parties to facilitate uh, that kind of transformation. As I said, what makes this hard is not the technology per se, it's the fact that we're looking at a truly cooperative model. And when you think about the different scales of granularity and control and aggregation, the implication of sort of optimally combining management of energy systems across these different scales is that actors at the different scales have to have some degree of trust in each other. We can design governance, we can design rules to protect players, to protect individuals' interests, and to you know, establish this, this set of ground rules and, uh, and protections. But when you're first implementing a design like this, there has to be some element of trusting that other parties are engaging uh, in good faith to try and make this work. And that includes, for example, trust between uh, renters and property owners, the landlord tenant problem uh, when it comes to making energy investments and uh, improvements is a classic, um, you know, classic challenge. Um, who benefits? How do we uh, feel confident that we will share the benefits across the different participants? Trust between um, the participants and the electric utility, uh, the city government, the permitting department, the inspectors, right? Um, trust amongst the neighbors to engage in a community like that where they will have shared ownership of resources and the responsibility to decide what happens with it after UC Berkeley and the researchers walk away in a couple of years. Um, so there is a lot of challenge in the area of um, really regulation and, uh, and setting precedent. We think that after, um, an eco, the, after the first eco block has been successfully built, it will be easier for the second one to say, well, we'll do it like that one, except with some modifications. The 10th and the 100th hopefully will start to become more routine and then it will be easier for people to trust that uh, there, is, there is an example uh, that they can follow. So with that, I will uh, stop for questions. 
Thank you so much, Sasa, for an excellent presentation. I, I've seen your material before, but I always learn from it, and so I really appreciate it. Uh, as I hear your talk, Sasa, just, just to get the ball rolling, it seems to me that there is a huge gap between those who envision and imagine a dream about the digital transformation in terms of computer science and IoT and AI, you know, and ubiquitous systems all over the place, and the harsh reality on the ground, mm -hmm. which is uh, buildings are here, they have an average lifespan of 100 years, and uh, they represent various socioeconomic strata. And so how will this transformation be done? And I'm not talking about equity and social justice as important as they are. I'm talking about how do we address 70% of the problem quickly? So maybe you can reflect a little bit on this gap in your experience and what can we do to bridge it? That's such a great point, Costas, because I absolutely agree. You know, the realities of just real life um, that, uh, that you deal with when you're implementing um, something even as standard as, you know, a home energy management system or a new smart breaker panel. Um, you find that, well, okay, in some houses you have different space constraints. Um, the, it's the people that really are key here. Um, and the, the interactions, you know, the trust, the, the community building that I think one big lesson learned uh, in our research team is that you really have to devote the resources to the sociological dimension of it. Understanding the technology um, or even the legal regulations is not enough. So in our project, we've had a dedicated professional community outreach person um, on our team um, to wh whose job it is to know everyone and to really learn about what the different participants care about. Um, in a sense, you can think of that human dimension as just being incredibly data rich. There is so much texture, so many layers of data in the you know the different human experiences and uh, the different interests and priorities that the various participants have, um, that um, you know is a is a, a kind of information that's really not amenable to some of the formal uh, processes that as engineers we know of, but um, there are. Uh, there is formal knowledge um, in the social sciences, which I think increasingly we have to work with social scientists and apply that uh, to understand how we can, um, you know, gain trust, credibility, and make programs like this really exciting uh, for the people who join because it's part of it's part of an identity, it's part of a community identity. And uh, I think there's a lot of positive dynamics that can be uh, brought to bear. Thank you, Sasa. The problem is truly multidisciplinary uh, and we have to address it as such. So I appreciate that. Uh, there is uh, one uh, raised hand and, uh, uh, that I would like to ask to unmute. Uh, Sitra, you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Great talk. Uh, this topic is really uh, near and dear to my heart. So my question is regarding um, uh, the uh, comfort aspects of the building. So there's generally this um, reaction to even ju just demand response type programs, right? That people get really uncomfortable during demand response and they don't like the fact that they don't get to control the rate of demand response, especially uh, thermostat related, temperature related demand res response programs. Uh, and there is not enough data that supports exactly how, uh, you know, whether people are uncomfortable during those events or not. So I, my question is, how do you deal with that dimension in this project? Uh, in your performance evaluation methodology, is there a component that looks into how people um, react in terms of comfort uh, created during these events? We certainly have a, a component of uh, surveying and trying to get as much data back uh, as we can uh, and candid feedback uh, from participants. 
I would say that, you know, roughly we aim to set the threshold on surveying uh, people at the level where we're not creating uh, more inconvenience by having too many questions to answer. Um, but uh, I think really a key element is having control and some ownership of the process um, and really agency in the process, starting from the design of the system and then being able to make adjustments and modifications. So we're not there yet uh, with, you know, we, we haven't installed. We're uh, early next year uh, is the start of the physical construction. So uh, we're not there yet in terms of um, modulating uh, loads or having to uh, do any load curtailment. Uh, so, so we don't know yet how people will experience the impact. Um, the hypothesis is that the more people have uh, the ability to really choose and feel that it's their own decision, uh, what they will be, um, uh, what load they might be reducing at a given time, the more palatable it becomes. The other side of it also is uh, the thermal performance of the house, right? To make sure that uh, we're not asking people to sit shivering in the cold, um, or sweating in the heat that because the, the thermal envelope is improved, um, that the, the comfort experience is better. Um, and, you know, there's the indoor air quality uh, from reducing the natural gas burning. That's another dimension of the indoor um, health and safety and comfort. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And thank you, Sasa.